You've just put your first handful of hours into Baldur's Gate 3, and things are going better than you imagined, which is not something I can say about my dating life. Whether you've been playing early access or just started, there are a ton of little things hidden within the game that can help you navigate the world of Faerun better. In this video today, I'm going to go through some of my top quick tips on helping you get better or at least get more enjoyment out of your playthrough of BG3. These aren't earth-shattering tips. They're mainly focused on ways to streamline the game for you so that you can click less, bring up fewer menus, find information faster, just whatever it is. The way I typically do things on my channel is upfronting the knowledge in my videos so you can find the entire list of things I'm covering notated in the chapters in the description and timeline. Quickly take a look at those and just jump ahead to whatever ones interest you the most. If they all look like things you know, then please just feel free to shut the video down. I want to get you back and enjoying Baldur's Gate 3 and having a good time. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. Each one of those things does help me out in a very huge way, and I'd greatly appreciate it. If you need any help with any of the D&D terms that are brought up in this video or any other video, I have a full breakdown of these terms linked in the upper right-hand corner. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitch, where I will be streaming Baldur's Gate 3 quite a bit. Let's get started here on my top tips for getting better in Baldur's Gate 3. Loading into the game, one of the first things I actually want to do is jump into the options menu. And you might have done this. I do it with like all my games habitually. I can't stop. But there are some big things I want you to take a look at first. First things are your save options. Definitely put on auto save, but you want to turn down your max number of auto saves and quick saves because it's going to cause a lot of save bloat. It's going to take up a lot of space. Unless you really think you need to jump back 10 quick saves, I don't really think you need to have that number. I have these numbers set to 10 because I record content and it's sometimes nice to have like certain places I can fall back on. But I think for most people having this set to five, I think is a pretty safe number for both of these, right? Five means that anytime you've come across anything in the game, was like, hey, you know, this person's about to come to something hard. We're going to make an auto save here. So you have kind of five critical jump back points that you can just kind of swap out to. I quite like that quite a bit. But also, if you are playing on PS5 and you don't plan on playing on PC or you're on PC and don't plan on playing on PS5, shut off cross save. It will just save you a lot of time. What you'll find is if you keep it on, it's going to result in a lot of things happening, such as it takes a long time for you to load and or save. And you might be able to, hey, you know what? I got to go. I'm going to rush. I'm going to save the game. I'm going to head out of here. Well, it's going to say, well, you haven't finished your cross save. So just shut it off unless you plan on playing on both um, consoles or both platforms console psh, um, turn all that on but when you come down over here to show private moments this is only going to apply if you are playing in co-op so you can ignore it i'm playing with co-op with a friend so i've turned it on this allows my friend to see any time i'm playing in and maybe i'm doing a romance scene with a specific character or i'm doing specific stuff for my character this allows my friends to jump into those scenes in co-op System of measurement, because I'm in the US, I have Imperial, sorry guys, but you can also switch this from metric, which it is by default to Imperial if you are also in the US. Now, another thing here is a kind of a bit of a contention that I think has bounced back and forth for a lot of people is karmic dice. Karmic dice avoid failure streaks while keeping the result mostly random. I have this shut off because apparently turning it on actually creates an average lower roll. I think it's kind of fun to have it off because this way you're kind of playing how you would normally roll your dice. It can also be kind of a little rough and tumble, but I uh, sometimes like to play with fire. So I, <laughs> I definitely recommend uh, shutting it off. But anything else here for camera options, accessibility, you'll find it in these menus over here. Um, but for the most part, that's all I wanted to point out. My last thing I will say is center cinematic audio. I have this turned on because I have two speakers. And sometimes the virtual surround sound where you tries to kind of simulate where the sound of the uh, character is coming from in relation to where your, your camera or your character is pointing can sometimes result in lower volume for dialogue so i've turned this on to help you get a better bit of dialogue out if you really want you can do force mono which will help you even better but it just kind of make the sound audio um the audio sound a lot flatter and i think another thing that i've done too is keep my master volume at 100 and turn everything down to 80 for the exception of voice volume and this allows me to hear dialogue a lot better in the game 
Now, another thing that I think a lot of people have stumbled into, or that maybe they've actually played around with and don't understand, is the way that the inspiration system works. So we're going to go ahead and press J. I'm going to go ahead and press J. There we go. <laughs> and I'm going to click over to the inspiration tab, or I could just press P. Um, that's probably the easiest way to jump to it. So the way inspiration works is that it's geared around your character's background. And you'll do things that are in line with that background. So, you know, a soldier, for example, or an acolyte, folk hero, and you just kind of read the flavor text here, right? So let's read for folk hero. You're a champion of the common people, challenging tyrants and monsters to protect the helpless. Saving innocence in imminent danger will make your legend grow. And you can see here for Will that we've done quite a few things, and it has this little denotation. Hey, you know what? You protected Arabella from Cog and her, or Kaga, whatever, and her serpent. That, that serpent was wild, man. Um, but you have these little instances that pop up, and you might not really know what this means. You know, this is, they may be spent to reroll an ability check. You're like, oh, okay, I, I guess I kind of know. I guess I kind of see that. Well, what this means is an ability check counts for a lot of situations. So, okay, you're going to go roll to open up a lockpick door. Uh, you're going to go lockpick a door. <laughs> you're going to go disarm a trap. You're going to have a conversation with someone and intimidate them. You're going to try to persuade them. You're going to use your bard performance. You're going to use history arcana. You're trying to take a look into a tome of necromancy and you're doing a wisdom save. Well, you can use this inspiration to re-roll it. And you've probably seen, if you've failed any of them, you say, okay, inspiration, uh, parenthetical notation three or four. You're like, well, what the hell does this all mean? Well, it's because you're completing goals that fall inside your character's background. Take my character, for example. He's a soldier. So show smart tactics and bravery on the battlefield to enhance your prowess. You know, no one left behind. Ensure all the Grove's defenders survived the first goblin assault. Boom, I got an inspiration point. And how do I check that? Well, I'm going to go ahead and press I for inventory um, and just look at any character. You'll see up here at the top where you've got your camp supplies, you've got your inspiration points. So everyone's got inspiration points here, right? So you have that total cumulative inspiration point that you can take advantage of at any given time. And this allows you to re-roll any situations that really you wanted to get a positive roll on but didn't. Now, jumping back into our character screen, and this is the character that I'm playing on my solo playthrough for stream only. Um, we've got all of our conditional and resistances and notable feature kind of information about our character, right? And I think notable features is one that you'll really use a lot because this is all the stuff that kind of stacks with your character. Either uh, Ranger Knight, which is part of my favorite enemy portion of character creation, or things like Feller of Monsters, which is a passive I've been given by my uh, weapon here. But there's something outside of this screen I really wanted to point out, and that is the detailed view section. And I think this is the one that I've probably personally overlooked a ton until very recently. And from here, I get a lot of really good pertinent information. Sure, hit points and all this, this is all great. Attributes, that's all great. It's nice to know what my plus two initiative is. But I think the biggest thing that I like from this menu is my proficiency bonus section. Your proficiency bonus is going to increase with your level. I believe it four or five, that jumps to a plus three, and then we'll go to a plus four. Um, I think that, that maxes out at level, uh, level 12. I don't think it goes up to plus five. But either way, the proficiency bonus will increase. And you might be thinking to yourself, maybe you're new to D&D &D and you don't know what a martial weapon is. You don't know what a simple weapon is. And you're looking at it and going, do I have a proficiency in this? And it, it, it will tell you. It'll say like, hey, you know, you don't have a proficiency in that. Like, I do this, it shouldn't. Yeah, it'll say no, not proficient with martial weapons or great axe. But still, if you want to just kind of know on a fly, you'll see proficiency bonus, armor. While I'm hovering over it, it tells me heavy, light, medium, and shields. Simple weapons. It lists all the simple weapons for me and martial weapons for me. I don't have musical instruments to take advantage of. But why this is, why this is important is if I take a look at Shadowheart, she might have certain proficiencies that fall under her being a cleric, having all simple weapon proficiencies, but she also will have additional proficiencies, maybe as her race, her class, her subdomain, whatever it is. So it's nice to be able to know exactly which weapons you are proficient in, because this helps you in building out how your weapons are going to be, or how your characters are going to be equipped with said weapons and armor across your gameplay. Especially if you decide to multi-class into something, where if I'm playing Will here, only gets light armor because he's a warlock. Well, you know what? If I were to multi-class him into fighter, I don't get heavy armor, but I do get medium armor. And that's nice to be able to just kind of see everything represented right there.
I've deliberately started the shot on his back so that you can see that he is dual wielding two scimitars. And that's important because dual wielding is a mechanic you can use within this game for either ranged weapons or melee weapons. If you want to dual wield hand crossbows, you definitely can. I'm doing that on my half drow bard. Now, when you use an attack with your weapon, you'll use your main attack. When you're dual wielding, you have the option to use your offhand melee attack. What you also can do is this button right there. You can press R to toggle it. So if I just simply have that set like this, that single sword right there in the lower left corner, it means that when I attack with my scimitar, it's only gonna use the main hand attack. You can see right there, four to nine damage. It's right there, it has that highlighted. And I'm only gonna do that. But if I press R again, I hover over this, still says four to nine, but I'm now going to use both my main and bonus action. You see right there at the bottom of this, it says action and bonus action because I'm going to use both simultaneously. And why that is important here is that you will take the higher percentage of hit that you would on your main hand versus had you gone main hand, bon action, and then bonus action offhand. If you do it like that, you'll have a lower chance to hit with your offhand. So it seems the game rewards you for auto-sacrificing the bonus action in conjunction with your main action. Just putting the two together. But when you would want to maybe not do this, is if you go, okay, you know what, hey, um, I, I really need to cast a spell right now. So, I'm going to, you know, speak with animals, which costs an action, and then I'm going to use my offhand melee attack. That's going to allow me to uh, at least dish some damage out. Or... The opposite. Maybe I'm going to do main hand and then do a bonus action. Like uh, right now I've got Hunter's Mark set up as a bonus action because of uh, an ability. But this would allow me to, okay, shut off dual wielding, main hand attack, and then follow it up with Hunter's Mark, which is a bonus action. So use your dual wielding strategically because I think a lot of us are dual wielding. And again, this applies to you would simply press range weapon and then that button would highlight again and you'd simply swap on over to using single main hand or dual hand crossbows, however you want to have that configuration make sense for you. Moving over here to Vampire Hunter D, we have a lot of power in the hotbar. And I think that it takes a little splunking around to really understand how it all works. So let's take a really quick hot look at this bad boy. So you've probably played with this a little bit. You know, you have really cool little slider bars here that show you more or less of certain actions. And you have filters at the bottom that you can apply. So you can also press increase rows to make this kind of look a little bit more like a typical World of Warcraft or any other MMO um, bank of hotkeys, which is very nice. But then you can kind of sort this. Okay, what are my common actions? As in actions that aren't necessarily exclusive to me, but they are not spells or items. That's a kind of big thing here. And you have those little things that you can use. You also have stuff like passives here for toggle non-lethal attacks. If you're a paladin, you'll have your auras, whatever it is. But these all things all kind of come together in a pretty cool way because you can also bind keys. And what I mean by that is you can see that jump, hide, throw, and shove are bound. Those are they're not bound by the slot. Like this slot is not Z. It's jump specifically is bound to Z. So if I go over here into options and then up here into keybinds all the way to the bottom and you can see throw for example is k right there right or shove is v but if you kind of go up here a little bit you'll see these all these select slot is one through ten is or one through twelve is all bound you're like okay well what does that mean uh, none of these say that well press custom this is where you get to have some fun. So the hotbar can actually be custom built out in a way that you'd like to. And again, in a way very similar to what you have with, say, World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy, whatever it is. I'm going to press 1, and now I can use my Bardic Inspiration because I've bound it to 1 on my numpad or 1 on the top of my keyboard. So you simply press K, which brings up your quote-unquote spellbook. It's not your spellbook because you're a wizard. It's all of your abilities, bard, common, or otherwise. And you have this capability here to then drag certain things into this. You know what? I want my rain. I want my. I want my main hand attack to go right there, and I'm gonna swap these two around. And I'm also gonna put piercing shot right there. Um, let's go back to bard. We'll put my combat inspiration here. And you know what? Let's also put. I don't know, no friend, just for the sake of this video, right? So now. If I go back to this button, it kind of sets things up to the, its normal configuration, and I can say, okay, you know what? Coming into this fight, I'm going to do a uh, main hand attack. Press 1. 
All right, let's right click that and clear. You know what? I'm actually going to press four. I'm going to cast friend. This way, I can cast these spells that I want to cast in the way that maybe I have them set up in a way that I like the most. Maybe I'm playing a sorcerer and I want magic missile on this bar, or I'm playing a wizard and I want chromatic orb, or maybe I'm playing Eldritch Blast. What well, doesn't matter? You can set this up how you want it to be, and that is a really powerful situation. Also, look at all these buttons up here. Take a look at this photograph. All these are buttons that you can click to filter. Hey, you know what? What are my main action situations? There you go. What are my bonus action actions? Here you go. What's all of my bardic... Well, that's a bardic thing. But what are my level one spell slots? There you go. Hey, you know what? What are my level two things? Well, that's going to include your level one and your level two. And you'll notice any of the plus signs there. Uh, or what are my cantrips? Having these little buttons that allows you to kind of look at this stuff on a glance is very, very powerful. And I really enjoy it. The last thing I want to talk about in this section is item related. So I'm going to go ahead and press items. You can see this, this auto sorts items into here. But because I just, I'm going to say I, I don't like an, uh, an, an, or, an unorganized inventory. I clearly haven't organized my inventory before this video, so fuck. But what I like to do is try and pick up any of these, oop, any of these like burlap sacks and stuff like that. Because then I click them and now... This is filled with all of my individual arrows. So I don't have to have an items tab filled with arrows. I can just simply have all of my arrows in this sack to pull from immediately. You could even bring them out of this sack and uh, put them onto this bar or into your custom section if you want and say, hey, you know what? I really just want to be able to use this on the fly and there you go, you're good to go. So a lot of power in the hotkey bar, but I think it's one that the game understates and I think it's kind of easy to miss out on. And just to quickly show off, this is how you would dual wield your hand crossbow, you know? I got the hand crossbows are sick. But that is the hotkey bar and I think you'll get a lot more use out of it now. Another really big feature is inventory management. And it can get really cumbersome, right? You've got your ability to kind of sort these by filters saying, hey, you know what? I just want to see equipment. And then you can click this off or you click this up here and go, uh, what scroll situation do I have? Cool. There you go. Um, or you can maybe do like camp supplies. And that's an important one. So part of this inventory management system is also understanding how to select a range of items and how to send things to your camp. So camp supplies are something that you're never going to need when you're out and about outside of your camp. So they just kind of take up unnecessary inventory. You can see I've got 148 capacity against my 240. And I can sit here and just kind of click each one of these and do its thing. Or I can left click one, hold down shift, and then left click a whole range. Or conversely, just like if I'm navigating through like the Windows um, Explorer, I can press control and select individual items if I so want. And then I can right click and press send to camp. So why this is important is it's going to take all of my camp supplies, which are not pertinent on the battlefield or in any situation outside of the camp, and just send them to the camp for me. Let's do that. So now that went from 148 to 108. You probably have a ton of these camp supply packs. Yo, I'll jump over to another character. No, I'll jump over to another character. That is just taking up. <laughs> okay, I've, I've already done this. There we go. Yeah, Jesus. You have this and just send it to camp. You probably have characters that are overburdened and you don't even realize it because they have tons of stuff in their camp supply pack. The same thing can be said too about your alchemy pouch. You maybe have a ton of items here in your alchemy pouch that are over time going to accumulate and really cause you to have issues with your weight. So go ahead and use those things to the best of your ability. But another point on this too is, you know what? I don't have the highest um, strength because I only have eight. Um, so I don't really have a high weight capacity, but I know what who does is my barbarian. So let me go ahead and press this and then shift all the way over to here. This is all just items that are kind of holding up space in my inventory. I'm going to right click and press send to Sorlin, who is my uh, barbarian. Boom. There it goes. It goes over here and it's in this person's inventory. And I don't have to kind of drag this and drop this and drag this and drop this or press tab and go like this and go, okay, this guy's got over there. That guy's got to go over there. This has got to go over here. You can just simply right click and send to the individual or select a range or separate items for using control and send it to the individual. It's a lot easier for you to manage. Um, also, if you're wondering who these two are in the game and why you don't have them, this is part of a co-op playthrough I'm doing, and in co-op, people drop in 
to your game and they stay in your party permanently, even if they're not playing with you. So if you're looking at them going, well, how the hell do I do that? Just make a co-op game with your bros and that's their characters and they're always traveling alongside you. You can't ever get rid of them though. So keep that in mind if you do do that. That's a, that, th th there's your side tip. There's your side tip. But that's how your inventory management can really work out to your advantage in Baldur's Gate 3. Now, one of my last tips I want to talk about is your reactions. And reactions are a big point of the game. So I'm going to go ahead and press tab to bring up all of my characters. And then I'm going to press K. Or you can just press the spell book at the top. And you'll see at the end of everyone's list are these reaction things. And these are important because you want the game to ask you if you do them or not, because maybe you don't want to. You're only allowed to do an X amount of reactions in a given time. Reactions respond to events and triggers, even outside of your turn. You can toggle them on or off and whether they automatically trigger or ask for input. So I think honestly, have everything just simply ask you. Um, opportunity attack is not a bad one to do. Um, that's probably okay to kind of take off of ask, but I want to have have it so that um, the game asks me. Reactions such as opportunity attacks are responses you can have to events. Reactions can trigger both during and outside of your turn. Recharge once per turn. So I get to choose, do I want luck of the far realms or an opportunity attack in a certain situation? So use this to your advantage have everything set to ask so you can really decide whether or not you want it to go off if it is a reaction if it's not a reaction whatever it is it's something that you really want to get a specific response out of since we've talked about inventory management a quick thing to also do is add thing to wares let's click this and do this right click and press add to wares so that way when we jump into any conversation with anyone we can barter with if we go to trade we can just simply press sell wares and this will send everything like this immediately into their inventory and we'll sell it. But let's say you don't want to do that and you want to actually barter for an item. You, say, oh, you know what? I want this ax. Well, rather than simply dragging these things across, you can double left click and that will immediately send them into this section to make it a lot easier for you other than going each individual item. You're dragging it across painstakingly. So this should help you a lot when it comes to selling stuff. Helping one of your down companions is pretty crucial in Baldur's Gate 3. And as you can see right here, my character is down. Now you can use the help action and you'll bring them back up and they'll bring them back up with one hit point, but that can actually be kind of risky. That person will come up with a bonus action that they can then use on a potion if you so want, but maybe they're at a distance or you want to get more value out of this. So there's two ways you can approach this. You can use a healing spell on them and that's going to bring them back into the fight. Not a big deal. But you also can do this. If you jump over here into your potions, you can throw a potion at a downed companion and it brings them back into the fight. Now, using a potion yourself is a bonus action. Throwing it to someone is an action. And they don't even need to be downed. They can just simply be someone you want to heal. So let's take this potion of greater healing, right click and press throw. And we'll click right here where my character is downed. Healed them for 18 hit points. They're back in the fight and they can still use their bonus action to heal more if they want or do any other additional things that you'd want to use but using those throw actions or healing them to get them back into a fight is much better than just simply helping get them back up my last tip is brought to you by the letter t so you can right click things and examine them in fact you should really be doing this anytime you get into any serious engagement to see what kind of resistances your individuals are going to have or the enemies are going to have two specific saves for example doing a certain attack that might have a charisma save this guy's got a high charisma he'll probably save against it but this can be kind of tedious when you're dealing with multiple enemies so always kind of right click and press examine well all you need to do is press hover over them and press t i do not know what this is on the console unfortunately but all you gotta do is just do it and you can do it even on inanimate objects. You can do it on anything. Even something you want to pick up, you can do that. T is probably one of the strongest buttons in the game because you use it, you know, when you take a look at this, to T to inspect it and take a look more, more of a uh, look at it, all sorts of things. So T really is going to help you in a lot of ways in Baldur's Gate 3. And it's one of those things that's going to give you a lot of uh, ways to just push through the game a lot easier without having to right click and bring up other menus and so on and so forth. It is a much, much better way to navigate the game. And at that, it brings our video here to a close. So hopefully this helps you out and just kind of getting a little bit more out of the game. I didn't go through some cosmic way to break the game by doing X, Y, or Z. I just pretty much showed you all the tools that already exist. And I just spent 
way too long clicking through menus to try to make stuff for this video <laughs> but hopefully this helps you out in getting more of your experience in Baldur's Gate 3 if you have any other tips that you want to throw people's way by all means let it be known in the comment section below any kind of information out to the folk is always something I really try to promote but as always guys thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care